Pan tam był. Czy Ziemia rzeczywiście jest kulą zawieszoną w kosmosie? Jest płaska. Tak jak oczekują oni. Nie spodziewałem się co prawda tego pytania, ale zapewniam pana, że jest płaska. Generał Mirosław Hermaszewski, jak dotąd pierwszy i ostatni Polak, który odbył lot orbitalny. Dziękuję serdecznie za rozmowę. Dzięki. Dziękuję, kłaniam się. Jest płaska. Tak jak oczekują oni. Nie spodziewałem się co prawda tego pytania, ale zapewniam pana, że jest płaska. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? Because <laughs> we didn't go there and, and that's the way it happened. So in the 1930s, we had both August Picard and the Russians sending up high altitude balloons and they're looking out and they're not able to detect curvature. So we go forward about a decade to the 1940s, 1948. This is an official CIA, look up here, CIA.gov, okay, CIA declassified document from the Russians. I'm going to pull it up here in Adobe Acrobat. It's a little easier because I've already highlighted some stuff here. Same document. All right, so the subject is Earth Measurements, 1948, Moscow, Russia. Outer gravitational field and shape of the physical surface of the Earth. They're trying to figure out the shape of the Earth? Wait a minute. I thought we knew the shape of the Earth since Pythagoras and Eratosthenes, right? Well, apparently the Russians didn't get the memo. A study is made of the coordinates necessary for the solvability and uniqueness of solution of an integral equation by the aid of which the outer gravitational field and the shape of the physical surface of the Earth may be determined. So we go through this document a little bit here. Uh, it says the methods of studying the shape of the Earth, so this is what their goal is here. They're outlining some of that. The shape of the physical surface of the Earth can be determined with sufficient reliability on the basis only of data obtained from exact measurements. Well, that goes without saying, I suppose. And let's keep going down here. Let's see. We can regard the potential of the real Earth, by this equation here, apparently, as known correct to an additive constant, whatever that is, at all points of the physical surface of the Earth and only on the surface, whereas it is not determinable at all other points of space without knowledge of the shape of the Earth. So they're still trying to figure out the shape of the Earth here. But since the shape of the Earth is not known, the shape of the Earth is not known, 1948, the true coordinates of these points, B, L, and H, are unknown to us. So the Russians are having trouble figuring out the shape of the Earth in 1948. Let's look at another document here. Another declassified CIA document up here, right? They're checking out the firmament in this one. Let's go back to Acrobat. 1953 now. Geophysics light scattering, USSR. I'm trying to figure out how does light work in the atmosphere here. So we get down to page 19 here. It says, Dissertations defended in the Scientific Council of the Institute of Physics of the Earth, Institute of Physics of the Atmosphere, and Institute of Applied Geophysics, USSR, 1957. March 1957. Looks like March 23, 1957, apparently. The dissertation represents the result of many years of study of the clear daytime sky. The observations were carried out in 12 locations at various altitudes above the sea, various climatic, meteorological, and synoptic conditions. The observations were carried out mainly during high transparency of the atmosphere in the visual range of the spectrum in the absence of a snow cover. In the investigations, two instruments designed by V.G. Fezenkov were used. One of these was a visual photometer of the daytime sky intended for measuring the brightness of the firmament. Hmm. Interesting. Trying to figure out the brightness of the firmament. Again, 1957. The dissertation contains a certain formula of the brightness of the sky, taking into consideration only the brightness of the first order and derived, get this now, on the assumption of a flat earth and giving some conclusions derived on the basis of this formula. 
So the Russians are trying to check out the firmament based on assumptions of a flat Earth in 1957? Very interesting, huh? All right, let's uh, see what NASA has to say. Looking at this ntrs.nasa.gov document here, dated April 17th, 1961. Go back to Acrobat. Looking at this document from 1961. And it says, A trajectory simulation incorporating the above requirements is represented in Figure 8. In addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom and aerodynamic symmetry in roll, and the missile position in space is computed relative to a flat, non-rotating Earth. So they're checking out missile position in space computed relative to a flat, non-rotating Earth. Why would you do that? If the Earth is a rotating ball, 25,000 miles in circumference, why would you do your computations based on a non-rotating flat Earth? You're going to tell me that this simplifies the math? I mean, we are actually dealing with rocket scientists here. So math's not a problem for these people. All right, let's see what else we can find. That was April 1961. This is NASA.gov again. June 1971. So let's look at that one. June 1971. A method for reducing the sensitivity of optimal nonlinear systems to parameter uncertainty. Whatever that means. And we get down to about page 12 here, and it says, A numerical example problem statement. The example problem is a fixed time problem in which it is required to determine the thrust attitude program of a single-stage rocket vehicle starting from rest and going to specified thermal conditions of altitude and vertical velocity, which will maximize the final horizontal velocity. The idealizing assumptions made are the following. Number one, a point mass vehicle. Number two of the idealized assumptions that are being made for this example is a flat, non-rotating Earth. NASA making idealized assumptions based on a flat, non-rotating Earth? What's going on here? Let's continue. Here we have another NASA.gov document dated March 1972. March 1972, NASA Technical Memorandum, Determination of Angles of Attack and Side Slip from Radar Data and a Roll Stabilized Platform. Gotta love the titles, huh? Okay, abstract. Equations for angles of attack and side slip relative to both a rolling and non-rolling body access system are derived for a flight vehicle for which radar and gyroscopic attitude data are available. The method is limited, however, to application where a flat non-rotating Earth may be assumed. All right, let's continue. That was 1972, the end of the... We're right around the end of the Apollo program. So we go to NASA again, nasa.gov, December 1978. Investigation of aircraft landing in variable wind fields. Equations of motion. This comes up a lot. The two-dimensional model for aircraft motion presented in this section follows the general form developed by Frost, it accounts for both vertical and horizontal mean wind components having both time and spatial variations. The aircraft trajectory model employed in this study was derived based on the following assumptions. Number one, the Earth is flat and not rotating. That's the number one assumption? That's a reflection off the dome. You can't hide it no more. So we, we're going to see this over and over and over again regarding the equations of motion. 
they're always using it on a flat, non-rotating Earth model. Which doesn't make sense if you're developing aircraft and missiles and things like that to, f to go over a rotating ball. Why would you start off with the assumption of a non-rotating flat Earth if the real-world application is, a, is over a spinning ball? 1987 NASA Technical Paper, 2768, User's Manual for Linear, a Fortran program to derive linear aircraft models. Get that in Acrobat here, same document. And we'll scroll down to, I believe it was page 12 again. Program overview. Within the program, the nonlinear equations of motion include 12 states representing a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. More diagrams, more equations. The nonlinear equations of motion used in the linearization program are general six degree of freedom equations representing the flight dynamics of a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Let's continue. That was 1987. NASA.gov, May 1988. Flight testing. Flight testing a V-stole aircraft to identify a full envelope aerodynamic model. June 27, 1988, day after my birthday. Page four of their document. For aircraft problems, the state of measurement models together represent the kinematics of a rigid body for describing motion over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Are you the pilot? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, Am I allowed to say hi? Uh, okay. Hey, I just want to say thanks for All the right. smooth flight. All right. I do have one question. Is there like a specific angle of downward tilt you have to fly at? To three degrees. Three degrees for the curvature of the Earth? Oh, for the Earth? Because yeah, no, we just fly over over the troposphere. Really? Yeah. But, yeah. Do you have to keep like kind of going down because no, we actually have to nose up. The, the flies, yeah. Really? Because I was reading some stuff on the flat Earth that made a lot of sense. Have you looked into it? Which one? Which one? Sorry. On the, I was reading a lot of stuff on the flat Earth. Okay. Yeah. 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 True. True. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All hey, right. God bless, brother. All right. Have a good one. You too. Back on. I just got one question to ask. Flat or a ball? Well, I never feel as breaking round. If we live on a ball, surely we'd have to fly around it. Yeah, it feels uh, flat or a ball. It's flat. Not a ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's flat. Yeah, me it's too. Flat to me. It certainly does, doesn't it? And you, you, you've got that flight instrument that down there to keep gravity it flat. Exists. Gravity exists. Gravity? is an unproven theory. No, it's not. <laughs> Let's rock yeah. and roll. Cheers, fellas. Thank, Thank you very much for the. Hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, good. Um, I'm a fellow, uh, Casey Josh, I'm a fellow, just PPL, oh, though, pilot. Cool. Yeah. yeah, nice. I've got a couple of serious questions to ask yeah. you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, there's a bit of time. <laughs> curvature. Curvature? Yeah. Yep. We don't allow for curvature, do we? Yeah, for anything, not for you usually. Yeah. No, we're, we're round, we're a disc, aren't we? Oh, round and flat. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, look, honestly, quite seriously. Yeah. We are, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank you for... All right. NASA.gov, December 1991. Aircraft model for the AIAA Controls Design Challenge. On page 11. Once again, you have the equations of motion and atmospheric model. The nonlinear equations of motion used in this model are general six degree of freedom equations representing the flight dynamics of a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over, over a flat, non-rotating Earth. You guys start to see a pattern here? NASA.gov, June 1997. Talk 
talking about the SR-71. Predicted performance of a thrust-enhanced SR-71 aircraft with an external payload. One of my favorite aircraft of all time. That's just a cool-looking airplane, huh? Let's see what they have to say about a back-mounted hypersonic research vehicle sitting on top of the SR-71. That's pretty crazy. Pretty cool interior shot right here. And on page 8, Digital Performance Simulation Description. The digital performance simulation equations of motion use four assumptions that simplify the program while maintaining its fidelity for most maneuvers in applications. Number one, point mass modeling. Two, non-turbulent atmosphere. Three, zero side forces. And four, a non-rotating Earth. Now, they don't, they don't specify flat here, but they're saying the Earth's not rotating as part of their four assumptions that simplify the program while maintaining its fidelity. So they're discrediting the rotating Earth right here, at least by that statement, it would appear. Moving right along... We come to another NASA document. I wasn't able to figure out what year this was from, but it's a, it's definitely a NASA document here. I'm guessing sometime around 1997, as or sometime shortly thereafter, as the footnotes indicate. Anyway, there are footnotes that go to 1997. Uh, they don't go any later than that. Singular arc optimal control. Our minimum time to climb problem. In our minimum time to climb problem, the aircraft is modeled as a point mass and the flight trajectory is strictly confined in a vertical plane on a non-rotating flat Earth. And we'll just fast forward to the end here. See, that's uh, the dates there. The latest one is 1997. So that's where I came to that conclusion. Ziemia rzeczywiście jest kulą zawieszoną w kosmosie. Jest płaska, tak jak oczekują i nie spodziewałem się co prawda tego pytania, ale zapewniam Pana, że jest płaska. Round, we were desk, aren't we? Round and flat. Yeah. I'm sorry. Aye. Honestly, quite seriously, yeah. we are, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank you for being... 2000 Army Research Laboratory. This is arl.army.mil document here. Path loss measurements in a forested environment at VHF. Let's check that one out. Under data analysis on page 10 of their document here, multipath data. In this section, we discuss the data for the measurements described in section 2.2, figure 9, plots the transmission loss as a function of transmit antenna height for 145, 223, 300, 435, and 910 megahertz, respectively. The receive antenna height was 2.7 meters, and the range was 410 meters for all frequencies except 435 megahertz where the receive height was 3.6 meters and the range was 200 meters. The expected transmission loss in decibels over a flat Earth is given by the following equation. Has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? Because <laughs> we did go there and, and that's the way it happened. Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? Because <laughs> we did go there, and, and that's the way it happened. Yes, Płaska. Because we did go there. Nie spodziewałem się co prawda tego pytania, ale zapewniam pana, że jest Płaska. We get down to page 14 here. HH propagation through the woods. And taking the HH polarization propagation data through woods, both in winter and summer, we observed local fluctuations up to 20 decibels. We avoided these large dips in 
receive power by minor repositioning of the receive antenna. It is important to note, however, that the multipath from the local trees and brush can cause such variations. After the data were inspected, it became apparent that they tended to agree with the theory given by equation 2 plus some fixed attenuation and therefore allowed us to develop an analytical expression based on flat earth theory. I'll read that again. It therefore allowed us to develop an analytical expression based on flat earth theory. So everybody who wants to label us flat earthers crazy must have to uh, lump in the Army Research Laboratory as part of the Looney Tune bin. Let's see what else they have to say. Propagation of electromagnetic fields over the flat earth. What? Army Research Laboratory. A-R-L dot Army dot Mill by Joseph R. Melita. February 2001. Propagation of electromagnetic fields over flat earth. You guys seeing that? Check it out. There it is again. In the table of contents, figures 6 and 7, comparison of principal fields from an ideal dipole-oriented perpendicular and horizontal to a homogeneous flat earth. Figure 7, comparison of principal fields from an ideal dipole-oriented perpendicular and horizontal to a homogeneous flat earth. There are the two figures, figure 6, figure 7, over flat earth. Army Research Laboratory. Hmm. Back to NASA. NASA.gov. June 2002. Stability and control estimation flight test results for the SR-71 aircraft with externally mounted experiments. So we're back to checking out some things on the SR-71. And we get to page 9. Methods of analysis, parameter identification formula. Go through some formulas right here. And it says equations of motion. We come back to that once again. These equations assume a rigid vehicle and a flat, non-rotating Earth. For the SR-71 with external hardware attached. Back to the Army Research Laboratory, August 2002. Automatic target acquisition of the Demo-3 program. Demo-3 program, Army Research Laboratory. The detection algorithm. The algorithm described in this report was designed to address a need for a detection algorithm with wide applicability, which would serve as a pre-screener slash detector for a number of applications. While most automatic target detection slash recognition algorithms use much problem-specific knowledge to improve performance, the result is an algorithm that is tailored to specific target types and poses. The approximate range to target is often required with varying amounts of tolerance. For example, in some scenarios, it is assumed that the range is known to within a meter from a laser range finder or a digital map. In other scenarios, only the range to the center of the field of view and the depression angle is known so that a flat earth approximation provides the best estimate. Alrighty then. January 2003, back to the Army Research Laboratory, see, uh, arl.army.mil. January 2003. Scrolling down to the report document page. Talking about the scanning fast field program. And I guess the various models. The geometry profile is required because of the angular dependence of the sound speed on the wind direction relative to the direction of propagation. This model works over a flat earth and non-turbulent atmosphere. At 3,600 miles above earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. Wonder how it works in a turbulent atmosphere over a spinning ball. 
Okay, September 2009, Army Research Laboratory, computationally efficient algorithms for estimating the angle of arrival of helicopters using acoustic arrays. And on page 22, the estimated phases of the reflection coefficients have a dependency on range. This may be caused by a violation of the assumption of the flat earth model. So that you're having some discrepancies when you violate the assumption of a flat earth model? Hmm. And let's see, one last one. From the Army Research Laboratory, March 2010. Projectile field dynamics, page one, the 6-DOF rigid projectile model is employed to predict the dynamics of a projectile in flight. These equations assume a flat earth. This is August Cayley with V-Log Entry 184 at Mission Elapsed Time, 23 months. Now, right off the bat, notice that this is flooded with, with Saturn. Flooded with Saturn. And I couldn't help but leave a comment that says, of course you have to award them because without Hollywood, there would be no NASA. It's one and the same. Videos regarding so-called astronaut Don Pettit basically the head of mockery when it comes to NASA. I find it very interesting what he says during this interview from a few months back. He basically states the technology to go back to the moon has been destroyed. He'd love to go back in a nanosecond, but that technology does not exist anymore. But then he goes on to talk about going to Mars. Okay, first off, before even showing this video clip with him speaking about, again, this technology which I find very bizarre, saying it's been destroyed. How was it destroyed? He doesn't go into details how this so-called technology that they used to go to, to the moon years ago has been destroyed. And why is it this is the first time that we're hearing about this, that suddenly, all of a sudden, that the technology to go back to the moon has been completely destroyed, and yet Russia just announced that they're going to be doing a, a manned moon landing, and I put a video up about that, and China is allegedly landing things right now, but that technology is completely gone, and we're going straight to Mars, which is completely, utterly, and 100% hostile, not just inhabitable, hostile to human beings from what they've told us. Now, if you follow me for any length of time, you realize that when I started this channel, I was definitely down with the stars, the moon, the planets, all that other stuff. And I have slowly over the last two years come to the realization that planets are not something that can be landed on and that NASA and all these scumbags that work there are nothing but Satanists. And it's it's encoded in everything they do, say, and show us. It's to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a plasma, a plasma phenomenon, a cosmic plasma. So just put out this video called Space Station Upgrades. Take a look at that. Look at that. Space Station. We're in outer space. Okay, that's great. That's great. Look at that. Floating around in an underground swimming pool, so forth and so on. But I'm going to show you some real proofs that you need to answer because NASA surely cannot, or they refuse to, one of the two. But I got to ask one thing. How is it a video about the moon can get almost a half a million views and there's so many people that go over there that spend their time watching this stupid video, but they also spend the time to leave comments, but they never want to leave any proof. Well, here's some, here's some questions that really need to be answered because it makes absolutely no sense. Now, let's be real because they're not just fooling us. They're fooling you, too. You can continue moving forward in life believing that we went through outer space and that the moon's going around the earth and the earth's going around the sun and we're all barreling through the atmosphere at ridiculous speeds, but it's not true. And they tell us that very often. Look at this little piece from Harvard right here and tell me what you see. Now, let's start with Harvard real quick. This is Harvard's own website. See, Harvard Solar Engineering Research Program launches now in 2017. But let's take a look at the picture from outer space. Do you notice anything odd about the horizon? Just real quick. Let me just, that's their own footage, but I digress. Here's some more video from 
Harvard, which is from NASA. But do you notice anything strange in this picture? You see the sun coming up way over there, and you see the Earth right here? This is Harvard putting it right in your face. Just look at this real quick. I'm not going to say anything like flat Earth or globe Earth or anything, but look what you're seeing right now on Harvard's website from NASA. One more time, one more time. Look at this. Do you see that? Look at that. That's weird. Let's slow it down for the skeptics. Once again, Harvard through D.C. Do you see the sun coming up over the Earth? Wow, that's queer, huh? Indeed. Okay, so real quick, let's listen to the first landing on the moon, July 20th, 1969. Maybe it's not the first, but let's listen to the moon landing, July 20th, 1969. Let's listen to them as he's talking back and forth to Houston as he's landing on the moon. Hello, Eagle Houston. We're standing by. Over. Eagle Houston, we, Houston, we see you on the stairwell. Over. Roger, Eagle. Thank God. How does it look? The eagle has wings. Roger. The eagle has wings. On its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth, it fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Go for landing. Three thousand feet. You're looking great. How you doing, Control? We look good here. Fine. Right, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. Two thousand feet. Two thousand feet. Into the ag. Forty-seven degrees. Roger. Thirty-seven degrees. It's still looking very good. Here go. spaceships moving but it somehow set itself down but the one little thing nasa can't really explain is how come we couldn't hear the astronaut because he was on top of a rocket engine they forgot to include the rocket engine in their little video cast do you see what i'm saying can anybody explain that well no okay great let's move on Everybody loves to roll out people like Michio Kaku or Neil deGrasse Tyson. Whenever there's any type of doubt about the moon, the moon landing, the flags, what the flags were made out of, the crater that's not there from the lander that should surely be there because this is representative. See these large nozzles? That's a rocket engine. It's not a jet engine. 
It's not an engine like in a car. It's not an engine like in a boat. It's a rocket engine. And this is what a rocket looks like going up or landing, no matter what. But this is what they present us with. And it looks like nothing. It looks exactly like what it is. It's a sound stage. It's an absolute sound stage. And yes, it's a great big giant conspiracy, without a doubt. If a rocket just landed there, there would be a dune all the way around it. A crater, we'd call it. But I digress for now. Let's listen to Michio Kaku talk about going to the moon over and over and over. But first, let's listen to a scientist and what they actually really say to people in their own special language. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of pre-famulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fan. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. Now that may be comical, but still, that is the language that they speak in. They speak in their own arcane language, and there's no two ways about that, and people just drool over it. This guy in a white jacket is just so darn smart. You see what I'm saying? We have astronauts claiming they couldn't see any stars at all. And then turn the page, we have, NAS we have astronauts saying they could see all sorts of stars. We have Michio Kaku telling us that the, the flag was made out of certain aluminum foil materials and it was meant to look like it was waving. And then we have them saying that it was simply picked off a store shelf for $5. It was a regular old made in America, American flag. It's very difficult to tell the truth when everything is a lie. But we are cracking the surface. And that's easily, you can easily tell that's occurring by looking in the comment section with the very, very angry NASA people jumping up and down, explaining in their fantastic vocabulary exactly how stupid I am and how quickly I should die. But let's listen to the Potter's Clay YouTube channel's top 10 NASA moon landing hoax proofs, we'll call them. And links will be in the description. NASA admitted that it had lost, lost the original footage of man's first steps on the moon. YouTube and watch a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. It contains newly discovered evidence, which is part of the missing tapes, of outtakes from the first mission to the moon of them falsifying a shot of being halfway to the moon. We found never before seen footage of them faking part of the photography, which is in a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, which has been licensed five times and can only now be viewed on YouTube. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflection light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other ones. I was under the so uh, it's looking through a, uh, in the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Finally, the iris is opened up, and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near 
earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July. And then the 20th, and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier, and the moon is some three days journey away? So I took a year and I traveled across the country and folks, I've actually posted it on YouTube. It's called Did We Go? And the challenges, Geraldo, everywhere I went, it was just amazing. Moon rocks falling in Antarctica, Neil Armstrong's silence. But I was the first to report, and you played the clip earlier tonight, that all the science data, the telemetry data was missing. Now, Geraldo, for NASA to come out and say that all the tapes were erased, I mean, you must, it's incredible. Geraldo, this isn't just one tape. This is rooms of tape labeled Apollo 11 moon landing. Someone had to physically go and erase it. It's very challenging to try to prove we landed on the moon, and it shouldn't be challenging. It should be there. There should be plenty of evidence. Now, in this video, he shows really, really, in a common sense fashion, if you have a girlfriend or you, if you have a spouse, you realize how much hair ends up in the bathroom, ends up in the shower. Yet on, on the International Space Station, apparently there's no rules at all. You can be in terrible shape, still go up to the space station. You can have your hair hanging out absolutely everywhere. This is obviously fakery, and it's not even good fakery, to put it bluntly. It's so ridiculous how often you can catch these people lying and then how often you can catch the CGI. It's just beyond pathetic. I'm going to leave links in the description so you can keep following this. But the Potter's Clay YouTube channel does a phenomenal job, in my in my opinion. And he doesn't have enough followers. At any rate, Richie from Boston. Here's just a few for all of those people that can't seem to wrap their head around it, that their government lies to them. Actually, let me throw in two more real quick. Now, in 1986, I was what? I think uh, 19 years old, okay? Is that right? 67? Whatever. I never said I was a mathematician. The problem is I remember this happening, and everybody was so broken up. But if you put just a little tiny bit of effort into it, you'll find out not only was that explosion a hoax, none of these people died. And the way you can tell that none of these people died is they're all still alive and easily identifiable. And as a matter of fact, most of them didn't even change their names. And all of them have prestigious jobs, exactly like you would suspect they would after being involved in an enormous hoax like the Columbia exploding. You see what I'm saying? The Challenger, my mistake. It's hard keeping all this stuff straight, just to tell you the truth. And I don't do very much editing. But I digress. At any rate, listen to this. Six, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of you guys are really good at the detective work. Look at these people. Look at their expressions. Look at the facial bone structure. It's clearly and obviously them. And that's how the elites work. They love letting us know that they pulled stuff off because there's no there's no consequences. They can simply just smother the rumor with the media that they bought a long time ago. Moving on. Let's go to another one. And now this is a real telltale. And it's the Challenger explosion and the deaths of all of those people that are somehow have identical twins that never spoke at their funerals. That's the big one. If these people truly did have identical twins that are, why didn't any of these people speak, give the eulogy, anything at their funerals? But they're wow. still alive today. Think about that. Wow. If that is such that a brilliant. True, right? I've never made that a That is video. such a brilliant observation, Richie. Oh, not my goodness. Of, not one of them. They, I mean, that's the story. They have the same names. They have the same facial features, the same space between their bridge of their nose, their eyebrows, the same hair, the same everything. Why didn't, I mean, these are identical twins, mind you. 
the bond between them is closer than any other humans on the planet, but yet not one of those identical twins showed up to give a eulogy or even say a prayer. Truth has nothing to do with the number of people who are convinced of it. If you are 40 years or older, you may remember January 28, 1986. It was the day of a huge NASA catastrophe off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida, where at 11.38 a.m. EST, 73 seconds after takeoff, Space Shuttle Challenger exploded in a tremendous burst over the Atlantic. All seven crew members were killed, five NASA astronauts and the two payload specialists. Millions of Americans, 17% of the total population, were watching the launch live on TV due to payload specialist Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space. The media coverage of the explosion was extensive. A study reveals that 85% of the Americans questioned had heard of the accident within the hour. The whole world was in a state of shock and the whole world mourned and took part in the funerals of the space shuttle victims. The failure of an O-ring gasket of the right-hand side solid fuel booster was the cause of the explosion. The shuttle did not dispose of an ejector seat system, and the impact on the ocean surface was too severe for anyone to survive. The catastrophe led to a 32-month pause in the NASA shuttle program, and by appointment of President Ronald Reagan, the Rogers Commission was created a special committee to investigate the accident. These are the names of the seven crew members of the Challenger. First, Francis Richard Scobie, commander. Second, Michael John Smith, pilot. Third, Ronald McNair, mission specialist. Fourth, Alison Onazuka, mission specialist. Fifth, Judith Resnick, mission specialist. Sixth, Gregory Jarvis, payload specialist. Seventh, Krista McAuliffe, payload specialist. And now, the unbelievable. A well-known proverb says, if something looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, and behaves like a duck, then it probably is a duck. For a second time, this matter leaves the world breathless. So, this latest shock even surpasses the one 30 years ago. At least six of the seven Challenger crew members are supposed to be alive still. Four of them, even with the same name. Here is the evidence to review. First, Francis Richard Scobie, commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Francis Richard Scobie, born May 19th, 1939, commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Exactly 30 years after the Challenger crashed, he was spotted as a CEO of Cows and Trees, which was and today still is a marketing advertising agency in Chicago. When you take a look at these two pictures, you can see at least three features that show a strong resemblance. First, the same high forehead and the same eyebrows, and also the eyes facing slightly downwards at their outer corners. And all this always with his middle name Richard and the same age. You can find the picture on the right side also on his LinkedIn page. When visiting the Cows and Trees website, which I've opened here, you come across an animation with a rocket-driven cow. And the dust swirled around forms the number six. The whole thing reminds strongly the Space Shuttle Challenger on TV when it exploded in midair. Just how black would such a humor be? Michael Second, Michael J. Smith, pilot of the Challenger. Am 30. 
Born on the 13th of April in 1945, pilot of the Challenger. Michael J. Smith, 41 years old when he lost his life 30 years ago because of the explosion. The man on the picture to the right also bears the name Michael John Smith and he's exactly 30 years older now. The resemblance with the astronaut Michael John Smith is striking. The same horizontal eyebrows, the same grey-blue eyes, the same vertical indentation on the tip of his nose. We are talking of an emeritus professor for industry and system engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Michael John Smith email address is mjsmith at k.wisc.edu. Third, Ronald McNair, mission specialist of the Challenger. Born on October 21st, 1950, Ronald McNair was the second Afro-American astronaut with a doctor's degree in physics. The 66-year-old Carl McNair on the right looks just as Ronald would look today. One day this fact attracted the attention of some American citizens. When addressing him about the astonishing resemblance, it is said that he responded spontaneously that he was the twin brother of the killed astronaut. As the resemblance was more than striking in every aspect, some fellow citizens began to doubt this assertion. Because they did not just want to put out empty allegations, they began to investigate. Previously it was not known that the late Ronald McNair had a twin brother. Brother. However, there was a lot to discover about Carl McNair. For example, that he is an author, an educational consultant, and an inspired speaker. That he is the founder and retired president of the Ronald E. McNair Foundation, which he had established in honor of his deceased brother. One detail, however, could not be clarified at the time of that investigation. There are no indications for a twin brother of Ronald McNair named Carl from before 1986. Here's the report of the research of a free journalist. On Ancestry.com I have performed a search for Carl McNair, who claims to be the brother of the astronaut Ronald McNair. Carl S. McNair's LinkedIn page mentions December 16th as his birthday. On Wikipedia, Ronald McNair's parents are Carl C. and Pearl M. McNair. So I searched Ancestry.com for any birth or baptism records for a Carl McNair, born on December 16th, who his father is Carl McNair and Pearl McNair, his mother. Search results. In the birth certificates of Texas between 1903 and 1932, there's only the record of Herschel John McNair, born on October 12th in Roosevelt, Upshur, whose father's name was William McNair and his mother's was Pearl McNair. In other words, according to Ancestry.com, there's no Carl McNair, brother of Ronald McNair. Yes, have identical twins that never spoke at their funerals. That's the big one. If these people truly did have identical twins that... Why didn't any of these people speak, give the eulogy, anything at their funerals? But they're still wow. alive today. Think about that. Wow, if that is such that a brilliant... Truly, right? I've never made that a That is video. such a brilliant observation, Richie. Not oh my goodness. <laughs> Fourth, Alison Onizuka, Mission Specialist of the Challenger. Another Mission Specialist of the Challenger, Alison Onizuka, was the first Japanese-American astronaut. He too was supposed to have shown up in public after the Challenger catastrophe. When asked how on earth he could still be alive, he supposedly defended himself pretending to be Claude, the twin brother of the deceased astronaut Alison Onizuka. As his assertion was not seen to be credible, some fellow citizens set out for research about the twin brother of the astronaut. The astronaut Alison Onizuka was born in Hawaii on the 24th of June. At the time of that research, there was no birth register containing a twin brother, Claude. Claude allegedly claimed to be the younger brother of Alison Onizuka. If Alison was still alive today, he would look exactly like his younger brother, Claude, on this picture. The same eyebrows, same eyes, same crow's feet wrinkles, same nose, even the same hair parting. 
Lord, Lord Onizuka is a board member of the Department of Liquor Control, County of Hawaii, Hilo, Hawaii. Resulting from another more extensive research by an eyewitness. I also asked Ancestry.com to search for the birth records of a Claude Onizuka, the alleged brother of the astronaut Alison Onizuka. According to Wikipedia's entry on Alison Onizuka, his father was the late lamented Masamitsu Onizuka. His mother is Mitsu Onizuka. Result of the search? Your search for Claude Onizuka returned zero good matches. Here's the screenshot of the birth register. Just to be sure, I read it, the search for Claude Onizuka, this time without specifying the names of the parents. There were 36 results, none of which was Claude Onizuka. In other words, according to Ancestry.com, at the time of this research, no one named Claude Onizuka had ever been born in the United States. Fifth, Judith Resnick, Mission Specialist of the Challenger. Judith Arlene Resnick, born on April 5, 1949. What of importance can be said about her? With a PhD in electrical engineering, she was a mission specialist of the Challenger. She was the second female American astronaut and the first Jewish American astronaut to fly in space. And now comes the interesting part. At Yale Law School, there is a chair held by a professor named Judith Resnick. The same name, this may occasionally happen. However, not only is it remarkable that now she is exactly 30 years older than the astronaut Judith Resnick when she was killed. She has exactly the same name, the same appearance and the same voice as the deceased astronaut. And what is she doing at the Yale Law School? She's a professor of law for the Arthur Lehman program. Now, let's return to compare the pictures. Like the astronaut Judith Resnick, this professor has dark curly hair, dark eyes, the same shaped eyebrow, and the same lines on both sides of the face extending up from the jaw. What else can we see? Their mouth, the way they look, and their gestures are exactly the same. Here is another picture to compare. Look here at our mouth. The upper lip of both Judith Resnick's form a slight peak when they speak. Do you see this? And is all this at random or coincidental? Here and after, two elaborate investigations are presented about Judith Resnick as witness reports. Whoever compares the voices of astronaut Judith Resnick 30 years ago, along with Professor Judith Resnick, comes to the conclusion it's about one and the same woman. So let's finally listen to this voice comparison. Judith Resnick before and after 30 years. Well, I too am glad to be here one more time, and uh, I am hoping that the the uh, affliction that Steve Hawley had from the 41D mission mission specialist of the delays hasn't rubbed off on me. And there I think were fewer than 40 federal judges around the United States, and they didn't need a building of their own. They were tucked into facilities like this. And of course, what the U.S. government did was this was a form of tax and marine hospitals health care. I think the guys behind me are hoping that it hasn't also. Otherwise, they might. Throw of me course, off. is the Civil War, and with the Civil War and the North conquest but of the also, South. Otherwise, they might throw me off the flight. U.S. federal government. Government owned and I will now introduce about 50 buildings Ellen, Ellen is around the entire hoping that it has a United States might throw me, and me off none the of flight, our flight. <laughs> Are all these inconsistencies pure coincidences or is it about a worldwide deception of enormous proportions? One must not mistake the majority for the truth. Six. Sharon Christa McAuliffe, Payload Specialist of the Challenger. 
On September 2nd, 1948, Sharon Krista McAuliffe was born. She too was one of the astronauts killed on the Challenger. She was a teacher for social studies at Concord High School in New Hampshire, where she was selected from more than 11,000 applicants to participate in the NASA project Teacher in Space. If the Challenger had not exploded, she would have been the first teacher in outer space. Had she not died in the Challenger disaster, McAuliffe would be 68 years old today. In the course of the research about the space shuttle deception, also for Sharon McAuliffe, apparently an exact double was found with the same looks and, believe it or not, with the same name. Even considering the 30 added years, this exceptional professor of law at Syracuse University looks exactly the same as the astronaut McAuliffe. But not only does she look identical, but she is also exactly the same age. Note also the details, for example, how her hair growth extends from the center of her hairline to the left of her forehead. The same lawyer, Sharon A. McAuliffe, who works for Syracuse Law School in New York State, is also a cousin of Virginia's governor, Terry McAuliffe. And he, in turn, had supported the re-election of Clinton and the election of his wife, Hillary, as her campaign chairman. Furthermore, he stood up for the support of NASA, in particular for the matter of the rocket launching site on Wallops Island, Virginia, in the Atlantic Ocean. In all these researches, it is important to state that it would be one thing if a single crew member of the Challenger would resemble to a person still alive. That could be dismissed as a mere coincidence. But it is quite a different thing if six members from one and the same Challenger crew have a look alike, living in one and the same country, and in not less than four cases even have the same name. The rough guess of a physics teacher is summarizing this problem probability with the following figures and illustrations. By using a binomial distribution, one can ascertain how likely it is that an event with this probability occurs four times within ten years. Roughly guessed, this leads to a probability of about 10 raised to the power of minus 160. For comparison, the probability of being hit from space debris is indicated by computing experts with a probability of about 6 times 10 raised to the power of minus 13. So it is more likely to be hit by some comet fragments 7 times in your life than such a collection of lookalikes would come about. But probably this figure is even much higher. What kind of people would the NASA be composed of if they are able to lie deliberately and to bluff the whole world for more than 30 years? After all, the NASA is an institution which is devouring multi-digit billion dollar amounts of tax money and private donations every year. What does it mean if not less than four elite universities would be involved only in the worldwide space shuttle fraud? Well, I want you to I want you to swear to God on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Okay. If you walked on the moon, we're given the opportunity to swear to God that you walked on the moon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get the hell knocked out of you. Don't leave me alone. So why don't you just put the end to the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Several, knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. You really like it. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black, if ever thought of it. Saying I misrepresented myself. Get it away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You're a coward and a liar. You're a coward and a liar. And a liar. Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you talk to the administrator in NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. I don't hit people, but you're going to be on the deck unless you get well, I'm heading out. Get the hell out of the fuck out. Okay, take your stuff and get the fuck out. Why don't you quote me and say it's bullshit? I'm in the shadows in a wrong place. I don't give a fuck.
I don't give a damn about all that shit. This is full of shit. Of lunar orbit being falsified. Being falsified? Correct. We got an unedited tape from a source at the Johnson Space Center. Yeah. Totally nonsense. Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not... Uh, an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and and that's the way it happened. And, and if it didn't happen, it's nice to know why it didn't happen. So in the future, if we want to keep doing something, we need to know why something stopped in the past that we wanted to keep it going. Okay, so we're living in some really strange times right now, and many of you may, in fact, remember this. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that humans do. The first step should be going back to the moon for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons and then after that Mars maybe a uh, high orbit in uh, Venus atmosphere, maybe going to Europa. There's all kinds of uh, targets to go to places of interest in our solar system. The, the only limit to human future is in our own imaginations. Now, this is strange. This is very strange. This is a, a legitimate NASA astronaut saying that we cannot go back to the moon, we don't have the technology, and it would be too painful to rebuild the technology. And then out of the other side of his mouth, he discusses going to Mars, going to Venus, going to Europa, going to all these little imaginary places that are actually unattainable for humans to go to. And I'm going to show you why. Now, David Yates' YouTube channel, he's a gentleman from the UK. He took this video. Now, you can see right here, there's an airplane below the airplane he's in laying out a chemtrail. David Yates does the similar thing to myself and other channels where he discusses and attacks the fact that they're chemtrailing the living shit out of us and nobody seems to care. But the reason I save this particular video is, do you notice anything right here? He's at 37,000 feet, which is incredibly high. It's higher than most airplanes and it's actually higher than the planes that you can barely see whatsoever, even with the Nikon P900 that's chemtrailing, he's way, way, way up there. Now, the Earth isn't infinitely large. It's about 7,000 miles in diameter, and yet there's the horizon. See it? Because that's what it really is. It's not a ball floating through space doing this. This is what they tell you that we're doing. Now, pay attention to this, because this is absolutely laughable. Now, bear in mind, see this one right here? That's us. We're just rocketing through the atmosphere, and the sun's rocketing through outer space, and we're all dancing around, looking like sperm cells, actually, surrounding the ovarian egg, or whatever it is. I've, you know, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But I'll tell you what. You see all... This. It's bullshit. It's a big steaming pile of bullshit. 